just saw a shark right here, 10 feet off the coast. Just this fin, big giant fin going through the water. The thing was the silence of it. There's no warning. When I was young, I used to hitchhike as a teenager all the time. And I was hitchhiking um, down along the um, Atlantic coast. And it was evening, and I saw this commotion out on the end of the pier. And so I walked out there to see what was going on. And these men were down in this boat, and they had dropped these big hooks with meat at the end of a rope and they would row out as far as you could see. They would disappear into the evening, into the dark, and they would drop it out in the ocean. And um, then they would come rowing back real fast. This night that I was watching it took um, a couple of hours of uh, trying to reel this thing in. And when they got it up next to the dock, it was this giant great white, great white shark. And it was this flapping, and the water was foaming all around it. And it was this great life. It was just powerful life from underneath. I came back early the next morning, uh, and the thing was up on the beach, and its uh, jaws had been cut out, and flies were all over it. They were just buzzing. It was this beautiful creature. It was jaws just like its whole part of its face and head just cut out. And I just thought, you know, like, where does that life go? Where's that life force that was fighting so much? Like, where does that go? In our rhythm of earthly life, we tire of light. We are glad when the day ends, when the play ends, and ecstasy is too much pain. We are children quickly tired, children who are up in the night and fall asleep as the rocket is fired, and the day is long for work or play. We tire of distraction or concentration. We sleep and are glad to sleep. Controlled by the rhythm of blood and the day, seasons, we must extinguish the candle, put out the light, and relight it, forever must quench, forever relight the flame, therefore we thank thee for our little light that is dappled with shadow, we thank thee who has moved us to building, to finding, to forming at the ends of our fingers and beams of our eyes, and when we have built an altar to the invisible light, we may set thereon the little lights for which our bodily vision is made. And we thank thee that darkness reminds us of light. O oh, light invisible, we give thee thanks for thy great glory. I had this painting in my living room. It was a painting of Wounded Knee, South Dakota. The church that had been uh, bombed out by the government. It was like the last stand between the government and the American Indians. And um, so that was when they destroyed this church that had been sitting on this site. And so um, I had gone out there and I'd done this painting just of the steps and there were bullet holes pocked in it and everything. And I loved it painting. It was like very minimal, but it was my favorite painting I'd ever done. And everybody came in and saw that painting for years. Nobody ever said a single word about it. And then one day I had this professor who I really respected from the University of Pennsylvania. He wanted to come see my work in my studio for years and he finally came 
and he came into the house. He didn't even get into my studio. He got as far as the living room. He sat on the sofa and looked at that painting for an hour. He said, this is a masterpiece. This is the best painting I've ever seen. The very next day, a friend of mine came into the house and he stopped in the living room and saw that painting and said, I want that. Like, it was as if the professor, by having seen it, had turned a light switch on. The painting was so happy that somebody had seen it. It was like it had the matter in the paint, like the oil, like everything had like, like been, somebody had just turned it on. And it was this living thing. What we see every day is the sunlight that hits our earth and sustains us. And this sunlight is the thing that allows us to exist. So when you paint sunlight hitting something, you're not like just painting the colors of the sun and you're not mixing paint to try to match that color. You are actually trying to paint life itself on something. And the sunlight comes through that window right there. It hits an object and it lands on it. And that's as far as it goes. If it lands on your face, you're the thing that has stopped it. You know, a lot of artists, I think, are, are, are striving for likeness, you know, but that's just like square one. If you're going to paint something, you need to understand it thoroughly. So I studied at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, cadavers and anatomy for two years. When I was drawing a human body, I would know where the muscles were and what they were doing and what purpose they served. But what I learned more than that was um, the difference between a living human being and a person that's laying there who no longer has life in them. The difference is that it's charged, it's turned on like a light switch. So when I paint, I try to get that life in it. I try to tell my students, you know, once I've taught them everything and I watch them paint, if the paint still just looks like paint, you know, it just isn't doing anything, it's not going anywhere, then I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, it has to transubstantiate. It has to become something other than pain. You, you do all the work, you get everything in the right place. You mix the paint on the palette, and you go and you put it down. You're trying to match the thing you're seeing. And it might be right, but if it doesn't have life in it, sometimes you have to do something more. I, I jokingly tell them, I say, you know, like, like, you mix the color, and if you have to, you know, blow on it. And then when you put it down, it'll have the life in it. Something's gotta come through you, through your mind, through your spirit, through your arm, and through the paintbrush, and into the paint itself, and then it's gotta get on the canvas, and it's gotta live and reside there. And that's your whole life history, your whole experience, getting into the paint. And that's when people see it, and they think, oh yeah, I feel something. I don't know what I feel, I feel something. Because you've done that work. But that's when you can get something that's sort of alive. And you can't put words to it, really, because there's no language to it. I had a friend who was sort of analytical person and, and, uh, and they, 
they were a collector, and they visited me. And as they were passing by on the way to the studio, they looked down. I said, look at that flower. The color was just so vibrant in the summer sunlight. I was having this moment of like coming to tears at the color of it. They looked at it and they said, purple. And I was like, no, 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 look at it. Look, it's incredible. And they, and they say, nature. They had the words for it and then they were on their way. So the thing is to, to try to all the time think about all the possibilities and what's really happening, not the words that we use for things. Because when you use words, that's when we get into trouble. We use words and we're, we, we, we block what really is. But the whole thing is so wordless. The whole thing is so um, powerful and overwhelming. I think it's why we, we do simplify it by conceptualizing everything. Because if we could let go of that a little bit and open up a little bit, then we would actually be able to, it would be overwhelming for us, but then we might actually like come to life a little bit. In a way, it's about in a way, it's about the ineffable, trying to get in touch with something that's almost incomprehensible. You know, I like to say that I try to paint large because I, I feel like I have to paint larger than I can reach, you know. And I have to try to grasp something that's larger than me. Scale is important. Um, it's a physical act too, painting, where you, you you work on this way over here, and you have to move over here and work on this way over here. There's a real reason to move left and right and look up at the sky when you're working up on the sky and down at the ground when you're working at the ground. And you make your head actually move, and the viewer's head actually move. And it's part of the experience. The cycles of heaven in 20 centuries brings us farther from home and nearer to the dust. I mean, the fact that we exist right here, right now, is like, that's all there is, and it's everything. And time, space, matter, I mean, what's, what is the relative way of judging any of those things? All our knowledge brings us nearer to death. I mean, it's like, what is life? You know, it's like, uh, there's no, no um, explanation for it. And there's no explanation for what that energy, that, that charged matter is, that's that charged quality that makes this alive, that makes me alive. But nearness to death, no nearer to home. When I was a little boy and I'd be in the grass in my yard, and that feeling of um, being barefoot and the dew on my feet, and the sense of sunlight. Where is the life we have lost in living? That's the feeling where I know what it means to be alive, because I'm almost experiencing it for the very first time. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? So when you have that kind of feeling, you're actually tapping into something that can get into the work and stay there and live there, and that's when your essence is getting into the work. Because you want the work to be about what it feels like to be alive. But it's about trying to capture the um, ineffable quality of life, I think.